Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm not a professional historian. <clears throat> I'm a dedicated amateur. Um, you mentioned the Eagle Lake Depot Museum. That is a project that I've spent 20 years on. Bought an old railroad depot in Eagle Lake and been making it to a museum for 20 years. We've been open for 11 years. And uh, we have uh, a lot of wonderful artifacts. I've had some brochures here in the rack there. I hope you guys will pick some up and talk to me about that later. I don't want this to be a commercial. But uh, this presentation about the U.S. railroads in World War I, I did a part of this originally at the Bush Library about a year and a half ago. Uh, Robert Holtzweiss, who's the director there, has kind of a symposium. Uh, a lot of it's for rail fans, and they kind of share photographs and stories. And a lot of it's about modern day railroading, but I try to come in and do kind of a historical perspective. Because amongst my many collections is photographs, and so I really like um, scanning uh, photographs at high resolution in what we do in that particular uh, session. Typically, as we zoom in and see how much detail you can see, depending on how good the photographer was. And there's a lot of good photographs out there. What I'll tell you for this presentation, what's new for this edition is, just in February, a gentleman walked into the Stafford train show, which is just a model train show not far from where I live, and had 250 photographs from about 1915 to 1920, taken by a gentleman named George Lalumiere. Uh, he was a photographer for the Southern Pacific. No one had ever heard of him. If you do a search on the internet, you can't find George Lalumiere. All I can find is that in 1915, he lived on Avenue D in Houston. That's about all I can tell you about him. Uh, but he was at the top of the Southern Pacific because these photographs are embossed with his name and then SP and then Houston, Texas. And some of these are photographer or photographs uh, preparations for the Great War, you know, because we're mobilizing during that period before we actually get into the war. What type of photographs? Uh, these are mostly 8 by 10s black and white. Glossy and silver. Glossy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I scanned, you know, a few of those to put them in this presentation just because they're, they're give us a good clue as to some of the stuff that we wouldn't have seen or didn't see ordinarily. And so you will be the first group to actually see. Uh, <laughs> so I'm excited about that. This, this is the hard part. There we go. Sorry. There we go. All right. So I want to talk briefly about some of the interesting things about this period uh, in history, really 1917 to 1921. So the use of railroads, uh, supplies and material, and transportation on a scale not seen since the Civil War here in the U.S. Uh, and it kind of caught us by surprise. Uh, and I'll talk about that later. That's presented its own challenges. Sorry, this thing does not work. There we go. Yep, backwards, forward. Scroll <coughs> on, the, on the side. On the side, side. yep. That's what I'm doing. Scroll it um, towards the bottom of the remote. Towards the bottom, sorry. Okay, that would help. All right. The miles of track in the U.S. <coughs> reached its peak during this period. Really, 1916 was the official high water mark of track in the U.S. for the U.S. But in Texas, we were still growing a lot, especially in the valley and in the Panhandle and North Central Texas. So our peak mileage didn't uh, peak until 1932. This changes some of the economical demographics I'm going to talk about later, so I'll try to give you some idea of what was happening in the U.S. versus what was happening in Texas uh, in that period. And finally, you still know Wells Fargo American Express because there were banks and credit card companies. Back then, they were actually express companies. And the express companies were tied into the railroad. Before 1913, you could not send a package by U.S. mail. The parcel post law of 1913 changed that and allowed the mail to handle something besides packages. You also couldn't get signatures. You couldn't send money orders. All that stuff was handled by companies like American Express, Wells Fargo, Adams Express. There were about a dozen different express companies. And they all used the railroad for their transportation. So in almost all of your railroad vehicles, in addition to waiting rooms and a baggage room, you would have an express room. And we have one in Eagle Lake. The express room was separate because it was locked all the time because most of the things in there were insured and so it had to be a separate area from your regular freight room or from your passenger room. And so the express companies were tied in a lot and they generated a lot of business for the railroads. There was typically an express car that handled all the express shipments and whatever and so these were still in force in 1917 <coughs> and up till 1918. All right. Coal is still king as the fuel source. Yes, there's refinery and petroleum and stuff but we still, you know, are using coal for locomotives coal for burning and heating, coal in your factories, you know, coal is still king. So that's going to be important here in a minute when we talk about that. Animal fat was still being used as a fuel source uh, in railroad lanterns and in some other uh, lanterns uh, instead of stuff like kerosene. For the same reason, it was readily available. There was a lot of butchering. People would save the fat and rendering and they'd find that fat would actually burn. Downside is, 
and warm bed like this, the fat turned rancid and had a horrible odor to it. But if it was contained properly in the lantern, you didn't smell it as bad. But it was also used primarily in the war uh, for packing artillery shells. So animal fat became one of those critical products that it, the reason kerosene was kind of forced into, instead of natural, having occurring naturally, was the fact that this was being used by the government a lot uh, in the war. Congress finally adopted standard time. In case you didn't know it, the railroads invented the time zones. Okay? They did not invent daylight savings time. <laughs> 1883. It was called, in November 18th of that year, it was called the Day of Two Noons. The railroads decided that there was madness of all this local time zone where you could travel two miles and the clock would be off by 20 minutes. And how you could schedule trains. I always tell people, imagine if you went to, to the airport and every terminal from every airline has a different time based on where their home office is. And you're trying to change plans. How do you reconcile that? That is how the railroad chaos was before 1883. So they've been in design zones, implemented that. They basically told local citizenry, you can come along or you can do your own thing, right? But if you want to catch a train or, or you know, for shipment or for travel, you better understand the railroad time. So most of the country went along. But the government didn't force, uh, officially adopt that until 1918. Uh, the railroads in the U.S. will be nationalized for the first and last time in our history. And there's a lot that's come up just in Centennial about uh, changing some of our preconceived notions about what that actually meant and who actually wanted that to happen. All right, so, yeah, I do have a whole slew of artifacts in the back there. I'll talk about some of those, but you want to come by and take a look at them. One of them is this May 1917 Santa Fe Employee Magazine. That's the Battleship Texas on the cover, and it says they're Battleship Texas Pride of the Texas Fleet. So here's some of the issues. Before, long before 1916, 1917, when the war was really ramping up and we were being involved, um, there were some changes in the landscape politically for the railroads. In 1906, Congress empowered the Interstate Commerce Commission to cap shipping rates. Before that, it was pretty much free for all. And what would happen is, even though these railroads were supposed to be in competition, you guys have heard of people like Cornelius Vanderbilt and Jim Fisk and Jay Gould, you know, these robber barons. Well, these guys like to sometimes cooperate, you know, with their competitors just enough to set rates, right? And make sure that the rates were high, higher than they would be normally with competition. So people were tired of this, and so Congress finally empowered this Interstate Commerce Commission to actually set caps on the, on the, on the shipping rates. So what this did is, though, as, as typical, there's unintended consequences. As the rates would need to rise for things like inflation or cost of goods and services, like when you have a war and stuff gets short, uh, the ICC is lagging behind. Now you have a problem with financials because of the fact that some of these caps are no longer suitable as they were when they first started. There was an economic downturn in the 20th century that basically softened demand for railroad service. So what happens when companies have a downturn? They stop spending. What do they stop spending on? In case you're a railroad, I'm going to try to defer buying new equipment like rail cars and locomotives. I'm going to defer track maintenance where I can. I'm going to defer building new track or building sidings to expand my plant so I can handle more trains. So that's actually what happened. I stopped buying stuff until the demand starts to increase. Trouble with something like that is that you can't just build a railroad yard and build many miles of track, especially in 19, you know, 15, 16, 17, in any really quick period of time. And by the time they get to 1915, 16, 17, the materials are so short, now they can't get them. So this sets them up a stage for the railroads not being able to adjust to the huge increase of traffic that came long before we ever entered World War I. <clears throat> There was this other problem, overexpansion. You know, in the early 1800s, 1900s, <clears throat> kind of like the internet uh, dot com boom and bust in the early 2000s. <clears throat> that's happened with railroads. If you were an investor, that's where to put your money. Come in here. These people like Jay Gould and Jim Fisk and everybody making tons of money. You know, all the investors say, "How do I get in on that?" Right? Because all these are privately owned. And so they go in and they say, "Hey, if you build this, they will come. You'll find a way to make money." Well, people don't understand who haven't been in this. It's the same thing with the dot com. There's a lot of hidden costs after you build the plant. There's a cost to operate the plant, and that cost can go up depending on several factors, and almost always the revenue is not what you think it's going to be. So you have a problem with, with margins. So when that happens, typically the railroads go into what's called receivership, where they appoint somebody to actually manage the railroad and try to get it out of the red and into the black. And so by the time 1915, a sixth of the railroads in the U.S. were in that state. So again, that means they're not spending money because they don't have money to spend, and they're in the red. Finally, to Burke Strike, the Adams and Act was passed in September 1916. This actually established the eight-hour workday. Before that, the railroad could work as much as they wanted, and they did. They worked you out a lot. Sixteen-hour days were common for railroad crews. And uh, so when they established the eight-hour day, what does that do? <clears throat> that increases your cost for operations because of your employees now going to work eight hours. <clears throat> so that was a big issue. <clears throat> so now, when we're going to enter World War I in 1917, we find the railroads are not prepared to support the war.
So they were already struggling, uh, struggling to, uh, to handle a dramatic increase in, in traffic. So in 1915, traffic increased by 30%. That's a huge input for the roads. Again, remember, they've deferred maintenance. They don't have enough sidings. They don't have enough capacity. They don't have enough main lines. They don't have enough locomotives. They don't have enough cars, right? So they've got a problem already. The next year, 1916, increased by another 20%. That's 50% increase in traffic in two years from a period where we haven't been doing much of anything in terms of upgrading our infrastructure. Imagine if that happened with TxDOT. Well, it happens already, right? But then you see the problem, right? TxDOT can't just add all these lanes when we need them, right? They've got to add them once their demand's already there. Well, it's too late when the demand's already there. Same thing with the roads. The demand was way too late. You're talking building track, adding sidings, adding yards and stuff. That takes months, if not years, you know, in 1917. Very little of that's actually automated. That's a lot of still manual labor involved in that process. So they are no way these guys can ever catch up to the demand. And we're not even at war yet. This is still 1916 before we're actually in the war. But because you know this, we're selling to both sides. Okay? So our economy's booming. We're selling to central powers, to Germany, wherever we can because they have a blockade where we, they can't get a lot of materials. And we're selling to the Allies, mostly Britain. So we're making, our factories are gone, and, you know, this already, before the war shortage, just means things like steel and lumber and coal are already in short supply, and we're not even in the war yet. So now the government basically say, okay, to relieve some of this, we're going to start prioritizing shipments, right? You know, Here's the problem. Once you prioritize everything, you prioritize nothing. There were some cases where 85% of these shipments in a certain area were all top priority. What does that mean? How is that affected? <laughs> So finally, as soon as Congress declared war, here was the stopgap measure they were trying to come up with. The American Railway Association, today it's called the American Association of Railroads, AAR, but it was basically a, a board, a conglomerate board, that basically tried to come up with strategies and plans, and there are different railroad executives who are members of this. So they basically divided up six territorial military departments, and they were trying to basically coordinate the, I think it was 53 railroads that were existed in the U.S. at the time, to work more uniformly, right? And what they found was that, as hard as they tried, and what it was, they could not make up for the shortage of material. They couldn't make up for now government regulations, which further limited that available that material. They can't. They have no legal authority to deal with antitrust laws and labor problems. And you know they just can't handle the track. And the one thing they could do to maybe appease this, or it was the thing called pooling. And this is where railroads would kind of come together and pool resources and work as one. But that was against the law. The uh, Transportation Act of 1887 forbid railroads to pool. You know why? Because of Cornelius Vanderbilt and Jim Fisk and Jay Gould and all those guys who abused it and used it to artificially raise rates. So the railroads asked the Attorney General of the State of Texas, will you overlook this law so we can pool and we can handle this? And he says, no, law still in the books, I'm going to enforce it. So the railroads kind of got their, their hands tied behind their back. And these guys cannot get them into effect. They cannot make up for years and years of deferred maintenance, deferred buying and all of this sort of brought on by the war. So they're pretty much in a really, really bad situation. All right. So, as we've seen, they deferred maintenance in track maintenance, I mean, deferred investment in track maintenance, orders for locomotives, cars, yards and vision points. Now, there's this unprecedented demand when the traffic levels increase. All right. So, here's one of those uh, photographs that I want you to see if you're seeing this for the first time. Okay, so, now, we have all these railroads that are trying to order, they don't make their own track, and some of them made their own ties, but not many of them. So, but some of your larger railroads had their own shops, they could actually make their own locomotives and their own rail cars, right? So the Pacific was one of those. And so, the SB shops in Houston decided in 1916-1917 that they were going to build uh, rail cars and modify locomotives because they couldn't wait for Baldwin and Alco and all the other guys who have orders from every other railroad in the United States to do this for them, right? So they started building uh, rail cars in Houston to basically fulfill the demand. Now I couldn't find out um, from their annual report how many they actually built in Houston versus what they built maybe in Sacramento or Algiers, Louisiana, or somewhere else, because all those had to get you know, people to do that. But in 1917, they were going to build 56 locomotives and 3,808 rail cars in their own shops among them. That was going to be about $16 million worth of investment. Uh, Santa Fe and some of the other big roads were doing the same thing. If they had the people to do that, they were going to do that because it was more revenue for them. You know, The other problem with rail cars that the government mentioned earlier was the fact that now that we have all this material flowing everywhere and we're trying to ship these to ports and to you know, ship them other ways via ship, we don't have the ships, right? So guess what the rail cars are doing? Most of the cars you had, you already got a shortage of cars because you haven't bought enough. 
Now the ones you have are being used as storage because they're in ports where nobody can unload them and there's no place to unload the material. So now you've you exacerbated that car shortage. So SP doing stuff like this was a, was a big deal. It helped them you know, stem the top. Or the next one. So here's the car bodies that are being built. These are box cars. This shed here was actually built just for this purpose in the Houston shops to build these box cars. We move it to it. Here are what we call the grand grab irons, or, and they were basically on the time of the side of the cars where guys would crawl up. There's enough of these to build 750 box cars. Yeah, this is a pile of them. This is the first box car that was built by that shop, number 38168. Uh, uh, so, uh, got us in here at San Antonio rail car. That was one of the subsidiaries for the SP. And uh, there's a uh, interview of it right here. That's the first one shop. That was about June 1917. So, I told you the express companies were kind of tied in here as well. So here's a picture from the Wells Fargo magazine about showing just the huge volume of express, right? It says basically congestion brought on by the surge and war-related shipments, because a lot of these were shipped as express mm -hmm. items. All right. So, in December 1917, the Interstate Commerce Commission recommended federal control railroad industry uh, to ensure efficient operation. There's a story behind that thing. Again, I remember I told you that the, uh, the railroad formed a board that was trying to kind of coordinate that. Well, they basically, the Attorney General told them he was going to overlook the fact that they could not no longer do pooling. They said, well, rather than be subject to penalties or legal action, uh, we cannot make all these railroads work as one railroad. So you, the government, need to do that for us. So basically, the executive of the railroad said, you know, would you, the government, take over this responsibility because, you know, we're pretty much going to, to, to fail at this. And so, sure enough, President Wilson issued that declaration on December 26, 1917. Um, which Congress upheld a few months later in, the, in March 21st. Originally, it was just supposed to be federal kind of oversight, right? But once they found out how hosed up things really were inside there, it, it actually ended up being federal control. The federal government really had to operate the railroads. Now, there were some people that really liked this idea. The first thing they did was change wage classification to raise wages. So your workers were like, hey, we're from Uncle Sam now, this is great, you know, we're getting wage increases, we got the eight hour day, you know, we're not working 16 hour days and 20 hour days, this is great, right? So you're already kind of happy about that. Unfortunately, one thing that did was, again, raise your operational costs. And one of the sort of the serious things that people didn't realize until later when we start with the financials, you look every year at the financials in Texas and in the U.S., and I mean, the railroads are actually making money, okay? Operationally, they're making money. Trouble is, their cost of operation is soaking 70, 80, 90% of that out there. So your, your profit and your ability to reinvest is kind of being uh, subservient. But if you don't bother to look deeply into the financial reports, you can't see that picture. And so all people say, why are the railroads crying? They're making so much money, you know, not a big deal. Well, they're making money, but they're spending it too, a lot. So in uh, August 1917, there was the Letter of Food and Fuel Act. And it was as controversial as the Patriot Act is today. There's a lot of uh, talking back and forth about how the president could be a dictator because pretty much in World War I, unlike World War II where they count on rationing, uh, the Wilson administration decided that they were going to do higher prices to help motivate manufacturers to increase production and will appeal to the public for conservation to do the goals. And we're not, we're going to, there is going to be some rationing, but it's going to be pretty much forced just because the stuff's not available. So it's not like it's a, a rationing program. It's just we'll appeal for conservation and we'll raise these prices, right? That's another problem. Now the, the operational cost of the railroads goes up even more. Now, Uncle Sam's taking it over. <clears throat> it's not as big a deal because they're not filing the reports they were every year. Okay, so it's a hidden cost that's going to come in there, and they're going to get sticker shock when the railroads revert back uh, to, to their ownership in 1921. So uh, the uh, U.S. Fuel Administration started putting out this one of those uh, conservation efforts. This is in the uh, I have this artifact basically back there in the back. It's a little cardboard placard that was in the locomotive, and the, the locomotive engineers and firemen were charged with trying to save every ounce of fuel that they could. In fact, companies like the Southern Pacific actually, at this point had bonus programs. Uh, you could get a nice little gold hat badge if you were an engineer or fireman from the SP, uh, if you say, if you were the most conservative in terms of use of fuel for a particular quarter of, of operation. And so uh, other railroads did similar things. They gave bonuses or whatever to the fuel. But basically you were, uh, this actually went on after the war ended because it was such a successful program and the railroads as far as saving costs. Because just like with your car, you can save gas up in your car, or you can waste gas up in your car. It's no different from a locomotive and that by thousands, and that's the incentive for the railroads to actually implement some kind of program. Here's another one from Fuel Transition, this poster about, you know, order your coal now, again, you know, get out of Uncle Sam's way, he's the railroads for the war. Again, this is on there because to iterate that, yes, coal is still king in terms of fuel, 
Everybody needs it. You need it for winter, for heating, everything else. Industries need it for manufacturers. So don't wait till the last minute because you know the railroads are congested. Uh, Storage of coal uh, ability to actually get coal to market. So make sure that when you do this, you know, if you order early, especially if you need your coal, because uh, you know it's going to be later. You're going to be freezing. You're not going to have it. So this administration, the U.S. Steel, was created in 1917. Um, uh, Harry Garfield was the president. He had been the president of Williams College. He left that to take this job. And he put one more. And um, the main responsibility were basically to ensure adequate production of coal and oil to keep their prices reasonable. You know, that didn't happen. The trouble is, the winter of 1917 was severe, very, very cold, and a lot of the shortages were blamed on the U.S. Steel Administration. There probably is some truth to that, but you played one more time. An investigation later actually found out that really it was more the fault of the railroads. Basically, they weren't placed in federal control you know, until the four months basically after this happened. And so the ability of the federal railroads to actually get pulled to market was part of the problem. So when the US, United States Railroad Administration was formed, that's the one, and uh, William P. McAdoo was uh, appointed as uh, Director General. He was basically Woodrow Wilson's son-in-law. And he was appointed to actually organize this. And so they subdivided the whole U.S. into three divisions, but over time they actually added that and became seven divisions. And they each had sort of a subdirector or assistant director who would actually help organize and all those railroads in that area would kind of function as one. So one thing they did was there were a lot of duped up passenger service, and the thing is passenger trains never, never really made money. Okay, uh, so they would cut that back, and the employee heavy sleeping car service would cut back in effort to save money and to uh, a help capacity. Uh, before this, there was no uniform passenger ticketing. Every railroad had its own ticket system. They decided, no, this is nuts. We're going to have a uniform passenger ticketing. Everybody's going to use it. You know, it might be printed with your railroad's name on there, but the format and everything's going to be the same. And that made it easier for uh, you know people that were actually going to buy tickets for railroads they hadn't actually traveled with before, because now you're under federal control and you've got a whole slew of railroads that you're dealing with where you only dealt with maybe one or two before. Uh, competing services were somewhat cut back. Uh, you'll see in the timetables where, uh, again, trains that would not have run, for example, on some Pacific tracks, you know, that were from other railroads, they were still named trains or number trains, all of a sudden running on routes that you know you wouldn't have before because these railroads, you know, were, were in competition. Now. With uh, cooperation, you'd see a lot of that. And they started sharing terminal facilities and shops. Again, some of the railroads wouldn't have done on their own, and uh, the ARA couldn't have done this for them. So the mission was number one, return to the owners. It was never the uh, goal of the U.S. government to operate the railroads in perpetuity. It was always their goal to hand it back to them within 20 months of a peace uh, treaty being signed. Here's the other part properties will be handed back in at least as good a condition as when they were taken over. Trouble is, when the property was taken over, some of them weren't in that good a condition. So that's not a very high bar in, in some cases. Finally, and here's the one that's going to cause problems later compensation for the use of their assets uh, at the average operational income of the railroads in the three years prior to nationalization. Okay, so nationalization occurred in 1970, so you talk about 14, 15, and 16, right? And some of those years weren't all that, all that lucrative. And the trouble with that three year price thing is again, remember what I told you? It looks like the railroads are making a lot of money. But you have all this hidden cost in there that nobody's really accounting for, and it's sucking up all the revenues. They have nothing to invest. So there's going to be contention later on after it's handed back that, yeah, the three years you're giving us and the amount you're giving us doesn't reflect what we truly spent or what you truly spent on our behalf while you're operating these railroads. And so there's going to be a big fight about this in Congress later on about um, were these payments from the government for operation enough? And it turns out the government actually would issue additional payments to sort of make up for it. So here's another set of. Uh, uh, Photographs from over the air, and this is, this is some of the ones I like the most. Uh, how many of you have seen the military trees that run today between Fort Hood and stuff? You know, they you see the cars and the, and the tanks and stuff on there. Okay, this is the precursor of that. Go ahead and hit the light. Hit the, uh... There we go. So, this is most likely Kirby Yard in San Antonio. These guys are most likely from Fort Sam Houston. And they're loading one of these army trucks, you know, take a photograph, they're loading one of these army trucks onto a car. They're trying to see how they can stage these trucks and not just ship one or two of them on a car. You can go to the next slide. Here's the next one. So I see what they've done is they've loaded uh, two trucks here and they built this false work and they're loading this third truck on top of it. And they're testing to see you know, how well this would actually happen for, for these army trucks to, uh, to uh, tr transport. And so here's the end result. <laughs> here's truck A. <laughs> this one gets loaded first. You build a false work, load in truck B, and then finally uh, load in truck C in the end. So that's, that's the result. <laughs> Here's a uh, close-up photograph of the blocking, so that you can actually have the blocking, so that the you know, bottom trucks aren't going to roll into it. What uh, I like about that, here's a different one with different types of trucks. These are 9,200 pounds. Other trucks were Packards. I don't know what type these were. Um, but these were, in October 20th, they did this demonstration from the southern 
Department of Special Committee on National Defense, right? Probably American Red Association. So here's Johnson Harrisburg and San Antonio flat car 21930 with four of these army trucks on top of it. Again, building false work, uh, loading your bottom truck. They, they've got one of them marked here. I can see, hey, I can't see these others. So I assume that they built one or both these in here and then built the false work and then put these on top of them. But they're experimenting with this to find out you know, how they're going to transport all these materials because, again, it's a problem they hadn't had. Uh, certainly in any of the wars previous because these trucks didn't exist and weren't used in army service. Were those cradles one off or did they have to be returned? Uh, the cradles were probably one off. I imagine they just they built them, they probably, you know, just used the lumber for something else. They typically used lumber a lot during the time period. They probably didn't reuse it, at least at that time, maybe at some point later. <coughs> So here's some old style ambulances. Uh, they took the wheels off, but they've actually, um, you can see the springs that they're sitting on the springs. These are old type army. This kind of reminds me of Civil War Army ambulances, you know, it's basically it's from that, that period. But some things in the army don't change really quickly. And so they voted six of these on a flat car and found the right things. They've taken a photograph of that and said, here's the best way, the maximum efficiency we found for loading army ambulances. And here's an end view of that. Here's the Army supply wagon again. <laughs> previous wars, yes, I know. <laughs> and then there's an end. <laughs> so uh, I told you about the fact that um, uh, you know we had troops go over and fight. What uh, what I learned when I was looking at this and this recruiting poster that's in the back there, if you want to look at it, um, is actually what got me. I had no idea that not only did our boys go and fight, you know, the Hun over in the Great War in, in Europe. We actually ran the railroads over there because you got to remember by 1917 we didn't get over there really until September, even though war was declared in April. And you know the French had been fighting three years, and the British, it's a meat grinder, it's using up human capital like no war before it, right? So all of your people who would actually be doing all this work, you know, have been pulled into the trenches and stuff, and you know have been uh, you know are either dead or wounded or in service somewhere. And so now you have the French railroad system, which is on its knees, and of course, it's all the fighting's in France, right? So you have this uh, ability to, okay, we've got to go over there and, and operate the railroads, because if we get over there and land, you know, uh, in France, and we can't get to the front, what good is that? So your railroads are really kind of your backbone of transportation. So what they decided was that it would be good to have special regiments of just railroad men who knew all this, and that, that they put in service over there to basically build and operate the French railroads. Because they were, uh, you know, in the three years of war that happened before we got across there, the railroads were decimated, and they were really at the point where they could no longer provide their function, which was take men and materials to and from the front lines. So the British and French governments basically made the arrival uh, of engineers the top priority. It's the first thing they want. Yes, we need fighting men. We need these engineers first because if all these fighting men are stuck at the port and not at the front, they don't do us any good. So. Uh, several of the railroad regiments were assigned in addition to British or French military formations, and so uh, in, uh, while they were serving with the British Southwest of Cambrai, France, uh, on September 15, 1917, Sergeant Matthew Calderwood and Private William Brandigan, the engineers, were wounded by artillery fire. These were the first U.S. casualties in World War I, long before we got to the front. This article, you can hit the, the button one more time, this article from the uh, 1917 um, Santa Fe magazine, there we go. Uh, this June article basically says there were certain Santa Fe men that took it upon themselves that they were going to form their own company, you know. And you could actually do that. You go to the government and say, I've signed up this many men, we want to be our own company, and we want to go, go to war. And they were basically going to do the same thing. They were going to do railroad duty over in France. Um, this gentleman from uh, Yardmaster in Port of Kansas, Mr. Overpatch, was the captain. But the first, the first lieutenants were Fred Von Blucher from uh, the Roundhouse Formers at Galveston and G.C. Kennedy, who was chief dispatcher at Beaumont. So two of your officers in this group were from Texas. Uh, these are two, you click one more time, these are two posters from Ernest Hamlin Baker. He was an artist, he did a lot of posters in the, in the, for the Great War. These are two that had basically a railroad theme to them. I just put them up here just to show some of the artwork. Uh, posters were a big method of communication, you know. It's not any radio in World War I. The way you get messed out from the people pretty much is through, through print, right? And so these colorful posters, you know, were, were everywhere. It's amazing that some of them survived, um, and, but their message is still pretty clear, you know. They have an idea of an uh, eye appealing graphic, some big, you know, uh, you know, nation's counting on you, or some, some call to action, right? And, and then uh, some end goal that gets put into place here. Uh, here's some, uh, from, again, from the Wells Fargo magazine, some of the boys that in uh, the Houston office that listen to Company A, the Texas Italian Signal Corps. All right, so our boys, like I said, they go and they not only have to fight, but they have to rebuild the French railroad. So another thing that happened was that Baldwin uh, Locomotive Works uh, 
they had already been working on how to basically change their colleges and manufacturing so that you could build the parts in one place and then someone somewhere else would actually function and work like it's supposed to. Part of the tent, right, when you talk about very, very small tolerances. So, right at about, 19, at about fall of 1917, they started improving that. They started that during the Civil War, actually, and they started improving that, and they got to where they could do 20 locomotives a month, you know, to be shipped overseas to France and built there and uh, used in the, in the railroad service. By the end of the war, they were so efficient that you could do 300 locomotives a month that were shipped over. So these were shipped over in crates by ships, and our guys went over there and they assembled the locomotives, the rail cars, they paint them, do everything. They would fix track. They were the, uh, the requirements of the train is you'd have typically a, a U.S. Um, locomotive engineer and a fireman, but you'd have a French either conductor or what they might call a pilot uh, to help you along the path. One of the big uh, problems over there was the fact that their signaling system was vastly different than ours here in the U.S. And of course, in the U.S., our railroads basically kind of use the, you know, our traffic signals kind of came from railroad signals, right? The red, yellow, and green. Uh, over in France, they were still using different types of signals, and they would have different signals to tell you which route to take versus signals that would tell you whether you could stop or go. And that's a lot to digest, you know, when you're going overseas and you're trying to limit. So this French pilot or conductor would be on the train to help the engineers and firemen understand what those signals meant, right? So they don't end up on the wrong track or derail or something like that. Um, here's some boxcars. Evangel, France was one of the big uh, areas where these things were built. Uh, I think there's another one in here. Um, yeah, the drop side gondola. They have USA on there, even though these are clearly not USA made cars, but basically they were part of the USA effort, so they were under our control because, we, again, we were operating all the French uh, railroads uh, during that period. Um, these living loan subscribers, I put this up there because even though this was an appeal nationally for everyone, the railroads had a competition to see how many of their employees would sign up and actually uh, buy these. In the World War II, they were called war bonds, right? So everybody's had a war bond drive. World War I, they were typically called liberty loans, right? And so they would have competition to see, you know, who was there. There's a letter in here from Santa Fe basically saying, we're in last place, and we have these other four railroads that are competition that are, you know, kicking our butts, and our employees' subscription rates only like 70%, and some of the top ones are 90%. But it was a big way. That's another right there. Yeah. Uh, basically, ATS have at the bottom, uh, CBQ's at the top, you know, and so basically saying, look, we need to, we need to uh, do this. Um, so things that change in railroad stuff. So this is a, a, a railroad employee timetable. Normally, what you've seen at the top was built called Robin Santa Fe. But during the USRA era, typically it's subsidiary by the United States Railroad Administration, basically showing that, yes, while this is for the Gulf of Colorado, it's under the direction of the USRA. And so some of the, again, what you notice in these, some of the trains that you're seeing there are, are foreign, basically, from another railroad, and they've been used uh, during, the, during the war. All right, USRA results. So uh, in uh, March of 1st, 1920, uh, the USRA oversight ended. They passed the Railroad Transportation Act. Now, I remember telling you, wait, there were two wage increases for both passenger and freight traffic uh, by the USRA during 1918. The labor unions, obviously, wanted federal op operation to continue. They think, this is a great training. Shorter work days, more pay. You know, the guys take it right. They've upped some of our classifications, so I'm getting also kind of a false increase in pay because my classification is higher than the big bigger salary. They like it. But most railroads complain that, you know, they lost money and they weren't sufficiently compensated. Part of it was, you know, it's easy to blame government inefficiency. There was some of that. But the government hadn't done this before, number one. Number two, the railroads were in pretty sorry shape and they themselves admitted they could not do this job on their own. They pretty much asked Sam to help them, but freeze to throw rocks at him later on saying, oh, you lost money, you know, you're going to give me this money for three years prior, and it's a pittance. I spent, you spent more than that. I'm not in that, in that good of shape. So finally, one thing that happened was that it was that Congress awarded the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, power to regulate mergers and acquisitions, uh, abandonments, and things like service change. And part of the problem had been before, again, I told you the railroad was kind of the, the big thing, and there were basically they were overbuilt as far as the country goes. And... Um, what Congress wanted to do was ensure that there was some level of service that was maintained, but not just kind of a free for all, so we wouldn't get into the shape of working together. So that actually helped, and that's why in World War II the railroads performed so much better. Number one, there were fewer of them. Some of that was just natural attrition because of the Depression uh, and, and such. But some was because of the oversight. And so that worked before World War II, but the long lasting effects of the Interstate Commerce Commission were really bad after World War II when the whole financial model changed, and part of the reasons the railroads fell on their knees in the later part of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s was because of overregulation. What was good in the 30s and 40s was not good in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And so the government was way too slow to change that model. And so that was, some, again, some of the unintended consequences of government 
putting something into action works good for a while, but then not look reviewing it because the market's changed. Now the roads have a lot more competition from the trucks, which they didn't have in 1917, and, and airlines and all that sort of thing. And so they're actually, you know, the government bears a lot of responsibility for the fact that we almost lost our railroad service really in the 60s and 70s, you know, because it's not the green they were bleeding. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, uh, cut it off and ask if there's any questions. I see one. Yes, sir. How long did it take to build a locomotive? So, uh, from the time of assembly, you mean uh, from the assembly line for Baldwin? Right. Yes. Yeah. From the time of assembly, I think it took about six weeks once it was uh, put up. Yeah. They, but then when they actually refined it, about six weeks to construct a locomotive. Uh, you're still going to have to do some tests. That doesn't include the testing of tape to actually fire it up and move it and stuff. Actually, actually fully assembled and ready for test was about uh, six to eight weeks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Ken, uh, those, those Baldwin engines, were they. I couldn't see the wheel zero six two. Oh, they built all kinds, all types. Okay. But I mean, I think the most common was probably a, like a two six zero. Okay. Or two eight zero was the oh. and a four six zero. Those those seem to be the three that I saw the most photographs okay. of. That's a very unscientific survey. That's just what I saw. Okay, just what you saw. Was, yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, and, and that's just taking out what we brought. I don't know what the French and stuff already had. Typically, the French and the British had smaller locomotive arrangements. You know, over there. You know, than, than we did. Yeah, yeah, probably a lot bigger, bigger locomotive. It was your standardized. Well, and the other problem is that you know uh, a lot of tight curves and rays. You can't have longer locomotives because of the of the track layouts there. Yeah. And you got to remember, a lot of these locomotives you saw here were not ones actually taking stuff to the front. Right. You have like the equivalent of like a logging locomotive or a mine locomotive that these right. little bitty ones that would take directly to the front lines. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. But good question. Yes, the boxcar called the forty and eight. Right. Was that made in France or was that made that was, in the U.S.? That was French. Forty men or eight horses. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. And that, that, that one boxcar I think that picture was one of them. Yes, sir. Did they have to haul horses and their, their food and so forth too during the war? Because a lot of the war was fought with horses still. It still was, and yes, they did. Uh, now I don't uh, know that I, I haven't seen any shipment where we ship horses over there uh, ourselves. Certainly certainly we ship food stuff and stuff. That may have happened. I just haven't seen one. Yes, sir. Just like the very France. Yeah. The question is, for the local did they stay in France? Yeah, rather than bring them back. There was kind of a kind of like in World War II. There was this Lend-Lease deal, and the idea being that you know we're going to try to help them recover. And actually, I didn't talk about this, but you know we actually went and operated some of the Siberian Railway and Russian stuff right after the revolution, but before things got really, really nasty. And so some of the locomotives that we still have control of were used over there to try to keep some of the train service running across Russia. So the whole another chapter that I didn't cover. I might have missed this, but uh, the date the day in the U.S. and the Europe, that was the same? Yeah, four foot eight and a half. Yeah, that was sort of a, a pseudo standard, right? Except for the small railroads that went close to the top, like three foot eight or something. Yes. Hey, Tim, at the same time on this, we're shipping men from all over the country down here to uh, fight off the big threat of Pancho Villa. Where'd they get the trains for that? Yeah, well, that, and that's, they sort of, you know, overlap a little bit. Pretty much by the time we're in World War One, Pershing and all those guys are out of Mexico. Because they've got Pancho Villa somewhat contained. But 15 and 16, you know, those are trains all pretty much here down in the valley. And so you have, that's why you had some of the railroad expansion during that time period. But uh, that was typically U.S. trains that are just, you know, troop trains that are, that are moving south uh, as far as army moves and stuff. And so that was pretty much all domestic. But uh, it, it did bring a lot of troops out there. That was that was when uh, Carol asked about. We're going to talk about that. I, said, I I could spend another hour on the whole border thing. That, that's a great uh, subject sometimes. But yeah. anything else? Did I miss anybody? I had one thing that I saw on TV not too long ago was this wonderful uh, jet depot that was built in for, in in uh, Spain. <coughs> In between Germany and France. Okay. And it was very high end. It was, you know, yes. Sir. <clears throat> but the, the thing that was bad was the fact that the French built the tracks one size, and the Germans built the tracks another size. So they, everybody had to change trains. Right. At this yeah. time. I thought that was very good. And that was the case in the U.S. before they, they standardized on the gauge. You would have to change, you have to unload cars yeah. and load cars over else for the other. That's why one reason why they were encouraged to, to standardize track. I think I'm done. Thank you so much.